Peace and joy be with you. We've come to worship the living God. My name is Pastor Jen. It is a glorious day for us to be in community. If you are visiting with us, we are so glad that you're here. We hope you'll take a moment uh, to check in. There's a pad at the end. You can just pass it and sign in. We want to connect with you. Just a little bit about us. We are a community of Jesus followers seeking to live as an outward-facing circle of people seeking, reaching, and uh, inviting others to serve Jesus Christ. We are completing a sermon series uh, today. We are looking at the hard things of faith and what it means to be a follower of Christ, and we're so glad we get to do it in community. Just a couple announcements from Carol Craig, whose birthday is today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. As you entered this morning, you received our newsletter, which we call the TWAC, this week at Castleton. There are a few opportunities we want to highlight for you this morning. Our community trunk or treat is today from 3 to 5 p.m. Come out this afternoon and help be a blessing to our community. Everyone is welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Well, you can see we have a few more people up here today. <laughs> um, it is a blessing to welcome my friends from Eastern Star Church. Raise your hand if you're from Eastern Star. Good morning, Eastern Star. From the Performing Arts Conservatory Instrumental Ensemble. Performing Arts Conservatory Vocal Ensemble. Raise your hands if you're there. All right. And you'll see the Performing Arts Conservatory dancers this morning um, in worship as well. Last year, Butler University Choir and Eastern Star Church partnered together and so we have as well this morning University Choir from Butler University. Raise your hands. My good friend, Dr. Robert Townsend, is, is sort of the mastermind behind all of this. We, we get together and we talk about what we would like to do um, to change the community, and he's been an amazing friend, an amazing partner. I want to invite him just for a minute to talk about the Performing Arts Conservatory. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning to you. We're very excited to be here. Um, we started this organization about five years ago. It's an after-school performing arts uh, program, so we offer dance, drama, music, instrumental, and vocal. And um, our website, www.tpacindy.org, or you can find us on Facebook, The Performing Arts Conservatory. And I'd like you to just go check it out and see what we're doing. Uh, these young people today, of course, we have some of our friends, uh, some of um, my um, musician friends that are playing along with us. But uh, these young people work very hard, uh, of course, in their school. But we started it because as a music educator, uh, actually, and I, I'm going to tell it, Ms. King, Carol, I mean, Ms. Craig, I'm going to tell it. Uh, Carol Craig hired me at IPS years ago. <laughs> so, and uh, one of the things that, that we talked about was uh, making sure that we have quality music instruction in the schools. And of course, with a lot of budget cuts all over the place, all over the world, that was one of my concerns. So I started this organization because there were a number of them who couldn't take music courses. Some of them can't because they're in these advanced courses and it just won't fit in, this, in the schedule. So we're privileged to have them here. And we wanna, again, thank you for inviting us. My band told me that we got band members uh, from Eastern Star Church that came along. Guys, raise your hand, our rhythm section. And they told me, don't talk long, so I'm going to really shut up. Thank you. God is faithful through the ages. 
we have a reason to sing praises. Let us stand and sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 140 in your hymnal. for our call to celebration. What if your heart had eyes? Would they live in a permanent squint, seeking to block out every ray of hope and illumination? Would you don sunglasses at all times, intent on keeping the world dark and yourself hidden? Would they be scaled shackled, viewing the world through distant hurts, or through zeal bent on life your way? Or would you walk this journey praying for eyes wide open to see the pain of the world and offer relief? Witness the miracle of creation and rejoice. Awaken your heart to sure-footed grace. Together, pull some its rhythm throughout the universe. Marvel that radiance cannot be extinguished, no matter how bleak our soul song. Oh, awaken our hearts to sure-footed grace. Be swept up in love's tender arms. Know the comfort that only hope brings. Come dance to God's sacred song. You may be seated.
wonderful praise God our scripture this morning is mark 2 13 through 22 Jesus went out again beside the sea the whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them as he was walking along he saw Levi son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax booth and he said to him follow me and he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloth. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins but one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Imagine for a moment you're sitting in a really nice restaurant, the kind with real tablecloths, the kind where the silverware isn't plastic. And you sit there to eat slowly because the food is good enough to savor and, and the restaurant is quiet enough for you to carry on a great conversation with your friend. This is a real and rare treat. And then, the phone rings, and the table next to you, and the diner at that table answers that and in fact puts it on speakerphone. 
And he begins to hold his business call right there. And conversations all over the restaurant are interrupted. The server's slow because they can't interrupt the table. Minutes later, folks give up and they begin to leave. And eventually, the diner walks out with his phone call, leaving his beautifully plated food and his friends behind to go wherever that call is leading him. And it seems the person calling had something urgent enough, something life-changing enough that it couldn't wait, and so the diner answered the call without hesitation. And that was just a business call. Do we do, do we allow the same when the Son of God calls? The Son of God, the one in whom all things are made and all things are held together, the one whose grace saves us, whose kingdom is coming, the kingdom of justice and peace to restore the world. What happens when that one named Jesus the Christ calls? And more than any other kind of call, Jesus' call always involves matters urgent enough to be life-changing. And make no mistake this morning, he has called you by name. You wouldn't be here otherwise. So have you let your life be interrupted by his call? Have you been willing to leave some things behind to follow where his call would lead you? It is worthy of reflection this morning. As we take a look at today's scripture, it came in three parts. We'll work in three parts, but this story is about calling. Jesus' call, Levi's call, your and my calling. As we dig into this story for a few moments, let us pray. Precious Lord, we come to lay our lives before your holy scripture that we may find the grace that lies waiting there. We listen again for your call, the call of our lives. May we hear it. May we rise and go where you lead. In your name we pray. Amen. Sitting in a toll booth is a thankless job. You either freeze or sweat to death. People either ignore you or take their frustrations out upon you, usually by a blaring horn or some not-so-friendly words. That's the job of Levi in our scripture this morning. He's the toll taker at the border of Galilee. He works for Herod Antipas, and he's backed by the often ruthless Roman government. So as merchants trying to make a living bring in their goods ready to sell, it's Levi who digs through all their stuff deciding how he will take their pot profits through taxation. Like the tax takers of the time, Levi was seen as a sinner, a thief, an outcast, an enemy, often by the religious. Until Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, being followed by the crowds, walks by. He notices the tax taker and says directly to Levi, follow me. No more, no less. That's all he says. Jesus didn't promise him anything. Jesus didn't give him a future mission. He didn't give him a life goal. Jesus didn't offer a program or a plan for his life. The call is, really isn't sensible at all. Because to answer the call means to interrupt daily life. It means to leave what he knows and to go where? Only Jesus knows. 
Answering the call means choosing to follow a different leader, a different Lord, a different master. Peter T. Forsythe was right when he said the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom but its master. We all have a leader or a Lord to whom we answer. Sometimes it's our own worries. Sometimes it's our own needs, our own dreams. Sometimes we make someone or something the thing we answer to first. A Lord may have been unjustly or oppressively forced upon us, and so we rightfully find a new Lord for our souls. But this morning, as we look for our priorities, the thing we allow to drive our lives, we all have a leader or a Lord. And Jesus' call to us seems to make just one promise. That's it. A different Lord. That's our only very real promise if we answer Jesus' call. The promise is Jesus Christ himself to be with him, to be near him, to follow his gracious healing power because he is the Son of God. To claim him as Lord and Savior. Levi was answering to Herod Antipas. Levi was answering to Caesar of Rome. And in this moment, as he answers his call, he chooses a different Lord. Jesus calls, and Levi rises. But listen carefully. The word rise in your Bible, right there, about Levi rising from his tax booth, it's the same word used to describe Jesus rising from the dead. Levi rose from the deadness of life to walk into the vibrancy of life. And that path, friends, that path into the vibrancy of life always begins by obedience to Jesus' call. Son of God who leads. So as the story goes on, the second part, Levi begins to follow Jesus. And the moment he does, he immediately witnesses controversy. In Mark, there are eight controversies in a row. The controversies are always between Jesus and the authorities, Jesus and the religious, Jesus and other groups. Because Jesus' actions are raising all kinds of suspicion. And Levi... And the followers witness it all. And what they saw and what we heard in our story this, this morning is how Jesus responds to all the scrutiny, all the questions, and remains true to his call. His call of saving grace. And so Jesus teaches Levi and Jesus teaches us this morning how to stand true and remain committed to our call in Jesus Christ. To follow his lead. The first controversy is about food. Do you ever notice that so many controversies in the Bible are about food? It's not like people are stealing the last piece of pumpkin pie. But the controversy is about food because Jesus, as soon as Levi follows, he goes to feast with Levi and his kind at his house. Because the label of sinner was easy to stick on those who didn't conform to strict religious law or didn't conform to strict political gain of Herod and Rome. So Jesus is dining with, with faithful followers and all the sinners together at one dinner party. And it instigates all kinds of opposition, social opposition, cultural opposition, political opposition, religious opposition. opposition. And to all the scrutiny, Jesus answers about what it means to remain true to his call. He simply says, this is why I came. I'm a kind of doctor, and I've come to heal. That's my call. 
In the words of N.T. Wright, to be a good doctor, you have to associate with the sick in order to bring health. Jesus' whole ministry was and is to bring health and wholeness, not just to the physically sick, but our sin-sick souls, to our broken relationships with God and each other in community. This upset a lot of people for whom it was more comfortable to label people as sinner and outcast and shut them out. And right there, Jesus showed Levi. Levi heard, we hear this morning, the ring of our calling as followers. The ring of our calling, warning us not to look each other through our own human condemnation, but through the eyes of God. Reminding us that Jesus' call is our call. And our call is to extend a healing hand of welcome to any and all who would have need. And given the violence again this week, against race, against religion, against party, we are reminded this morning together to stand true to the call of Christ, which is to extend a healing hand of welcome to all who may have need. And right after that controversy comes another controversy, and guess what it's about? Food. You see, Jesus was feasting, and so were his followers. And the faithful Jews were upholding their religious fast. The times when faithful Jews of Jesus' day fasted were days that reminded them of historic days. Historic times of old, often in disasters like when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Surely Jesus, a devout Jew, would uphold that fast. Surely his followers should fast as well. But when scrutinized, Jesus starts talking about a wedding. Because there's something so beautiful about a wedding. It speaks to us of love and goodness. It speaks to commitment to each other. It speaks to the creativity of a God who gives us such gifts. Which is why the Bible writers use wedding images to describe the renewed world. God is eventually going to complete a world in which everyone is welcome to the wedding feast. Everyone has enough. A world of justice and peace. So then Jesus takes it a step further, and he begins to describe himself as the bridegroom and all of us followers as the bride. A disturbing new meaning went through the air. Jesus' call was to move forward towards a time of restoration, of new life and new starts. Jesus was bringing into reality all that God had begun in Israel and would continue through Jesus Christ. And as Christ stood in his commitment to moving forward with new hope and new renewal, he reminds us that we must be committed to the same. But here's what that means. It means being willing to let go of what is for where he's leading. We've got to be ready to follow him as it breaks our frameworks, breaks the boxes, our tightly held fundamentals. We spend a lot of time trying to put our Christianity, trying to put our Jesus in a box, in a political box, in a social box, in our favorite religious shaped boxes, our boxes. It's what they were doing when they questioned him about feasting instead of fasting. And his only reply a celebration, like a wedding party of the new and just gracious world he was beginning. And though we may not yet see it, it is what he is doing. And as his followers, we must rise to follow him in commitment to that new kingdom.
hostages were being held in a box of a room. It was filthy and dark where they had been for months. Navy SEALs arrived to rescue. They announced, we're Americans, get up and follow. But the hostages had been through too much to trust anyone, to trust anything outside their four walls. So in the corner is where they stayed, cowering and sick and in fear. Don Miller tells this story in the book Blue Like Jazz. Seals didn't know what to do. They couldn't carry them all out. So one seal put down his gun and he took off his helmet and he sat in the corner with the hostages. He got close enough for his body to touch theirs. And after a couple minutes, he took his arms and he wrapped them around the hostages as one of them. He stayed there just like that until they began to look at him, until their eyes met his eyes. And then he whispered, we're here to rescue you. Will you follow us? And following them, they did, those hostages didn't know if they would live through it. They didn't know how life would be outside the cell. They didn't know where they were going. They weren't completely sure where they were. To follow him, they would have to leave the security of their walls, the security of their day, the security of the known. But they did know if they followed, life would not be the same. So then the seal stood up. And slowly, each hostage stood up one by one while he waited. And into the light of the unknown, they followed. Life would be different and scary and new. So it is with Jesus and us. God came to us and Jesus and sat with us in the corner. In our fear and our pain, he wraps his arms around us and he's inviting us now to stand. To follow him into a world yet unseen, a world yet unknown, his kingdom of actual justice and peace and grace. It means if we follow him, we must leave our comfortability and our security behind. The security of self-protection, the security of our own priorities, the security of our fear and our fights. Because we can't fit Christ's new kingdom into existing ways of thinking and living. It's like trying to sew on old clothes, on, or new, clo new cloth on old pants. Eventually, it'll shrink and rip. It's like trying to pour new wine into old wineskins. It, eventually, it'll break open. What Christ is doing is to shatter ever so slowly the way we think and live, opening vast new possibilities of life and love and community. To follow Christ means we go into new ways, new life, and new hope. So here's your question of the day. Here there's always a question of the day. As a Christian, as one who claims Christ, has your life changed? Is your life changing? Because if it's not, it's possible, it's possible that you have been unwilling to let Christ interrupt your life. You've been unwilling to, to leave some things behind, to follow where he goes. Maybe you and I have been busy trying to push Christ and Christian faith into our boxes, our, our ways of thinking and living. But to follow Christ means willing to let him lead and change who we are 
and how we live. Because finally, I promise you this. Whatever box you find yourself backed into, Jesus Christ is on the floor right beside you. He's down on the floor in your tears, in your pain, in your fear, and he's calling you today to rise and follow him into a wide healing welcome of others as your life's calling. He's calling us into the work of a wide work of justice and grace different from the world we live in now. You and I have no promise in this calling but Christ himself. He is the Son of God, and He is enough. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Would you join me in prayer? Holy Lord, you were accused, good teacher. You ate with sinners, you touched the unclean, you offended common decency. We thought we were alone with our tears and pain and anger, but you came, dear Jesus. You came to bear our pain. We thought you came to bless just us, but you kept going to those we do not understand, to those we do not trust, to those we fear. All of these you've blessed and healed. Those we distance ourselves from, you actually touch, so we grumble at you. Not sure that we can follow you in the way you call. Not sure enough to overcome what we have always been taught. Not open enough to see the depth and breadth of your grace. Forgive us. This morning, O oh God, come. Turn our grumbling into acts of courage. Turn our, turn our codes of conduct into compassion. Turn our condemnation into eyes that see the humanity in every other eye. Forgive us, Jesus. Make us new until we become one with you and one with each other, one in faith, one in hope, one in service to the needs of the world. Help us follow you as those lost and secure in your love. We pray all this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who is Lord and Savior, companion and friend, and all God's people said,
Hi everyone, I'm Ashlea Barnett. I'm the new Associate Director of Family Ministries here at Castleton, and I'm beyond excited to be able to come serve with all of you. There is nothing that makes my heart happier than to see children get excited about Jesus and find their own place at God's gracious table. I'm also in the process of finishing up my call to ministry as an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. My official start date is Monday, November the 26th, but you will have the opportunity to meet me, my husband Richard, and our three girls, Katie, Olivia, and Ella, in worship on Sunday, November the 25th. Until then, holding all of you in my prayers and many blessings. In this time as we prepare for the offering, not only are we staffing in such a way to serve families in this mission field, not only to serve the families inside the church, but to connect with Crestview Elementary and the apartment complexes to be in community together, but I want you to know in a week's time, in the building behind us, courageous neighbors are going to come and stay with us and live with us for a week. These families are experiencing homelessness, and we are honored that they will live with us here as they work to get on their feet. We are part of Interfaith Hospitality Network. These families will be living here. They will be showering here. There will be bedtime stories. There will be chasing and playing tag throughout the building. It will be a time of family. Our commitment is to serve families in whatever shape, the form, or age they find themselves in this community, and none of that is possible without your faithfulness. What you are doing as you give is taking part in reaching others with God's transformational love. And so today, again, I say thank you. Thank you for your faithful giving to the work of Jesus Christ through this church. Let us give our best to the God who loves us most with the ushers wait upon us.
gracious God, <coughs> holy God, ever-loving God, you have given each of us gifts to use as members of the body of Christ. Here are our gifts, the work of our hands, our hearts, and our lives. We pray that they may help to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to our troubled world today. And may we answer to your call as we follow Jesus Christ for restoration. And may this happen always here and everywhere. Amen. You may be seated. worship our Lord and Savior with you. 
As we prepare to go this day, hear again the call of Jesus Christ who is calling you by name. We go to live in a way into a world yet unseen, but by faith we claim it today. Amen? Amen. So as you go today, go to follow the one who leads and grace and mercy. Because, repeat after me, we have one faith. We have one hope. We have one Savior. One Savior. And one service, one service to the needs of the world. Amen. Would you stay standing for the last song? Ever victorious, he's a great God.